This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening, my name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer for the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. It is my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Hawke Centre, the University of South Australia and the University of Adelaide. In doing so, I take this opportunity to acknowledge that the University of South Australia is on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains, we recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. I'm delighted to see a full house here tonight and those who have joined via live stream as we delve into the profound experiences of reading and writing amidst adversity during and following incarceration. Facilitated by acclaimed journalist, Professor Peter Grester, we will discover the resilience of our panellists and explore the role that reading and writing played in their journey. And I really want to very much warmly welcome Professor Peter Grester, Geraldine Brooks AO, Dr Kylie Moore Gilbert and Burus Bachani, who is joining us um, from Lisbon. He will be on the screen shortly. The Hawke Centre is co-presenting tonight's event with the um, JM Kutsi Centre for Creative Practice at the University of Adelaide. I would like to thank my co-presenter, Anne Pender, Director of the JM Kutsi Centre for Creative Practice, and also to welcome Professor John Kutsi. Thank you so much. There you are. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and also to Jill Saunders, Executive Assistant to the late Honourable Bob Hawke AC. The Hawke Centre is committed to delivering a free and diverse program of events and exhibitions throughout the year, which reflect our fundamental themes of strengthening our democracy, valuing our diversity and building our future. Please join me in welcoming our array of wonderful guests. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jacinta. And um, it's always fantastic to be here at the Hawke Centre. This is such a warm, generous audience. So thank you very much for coming and joining us. You know, at, the, at these kinds of events, um, the standard opening line for a presenter is to say what a privilege it is to be on stage with such a remarkable group of people. But for me, this really is an absolute privilege. Um, I have had the good fortune of meeting and talking to each of the three panellists um, personally long before this. I've shared stages with them all and I can't honestly think of, of a group of writers and individuals who I would rather see uh, up here on stage. So it really is a fantastic honour to be here. Uh, first of all, we have Beruz Bachani, um, who is perhaps the best known of the detainees held on Manus Island. Uh, but he's also become justifiably well known for his extraordinary journalism, for his writing and his advocacy. He is a Kurdish Iranian and deeply immersed in the extraordinary literary cultures of both, of, of both Kurdish and Iranian culture. Uh, Kylie is an academic uh, who studied Iranian politics and who was arrested in Tehran at the end of a research trip. She spent more than 800 days behind bars. Makes me feel like a bit of a lightweight. Um, she has gone on to write about her experiences um, in a, an amazing book called The Uncaged Sky. I thoroughly recommend it to all of you in which she really showed that she has some, also some extraordinary writing skills. And finally, Geraldine Brooks, who I'm sure most of you will know as a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist. Um, but Geraldine not only is a prolific uh, writer of, of fiction, she also had an illustrious career as a, as a foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. And in fact, 
Um, I remember on a lot of the stories, a lot of the, the uh, places that I covered, I found myself uh, trailing in Geraldine's footsteps. Uh, Geraldine is, knows both through her fiction and her non-fiction the power of writing, but also the power of writing and reading dangerously. So, ladies and gentlemen, I guess if there is a, a single theme, a place that unites all of the people on stage, either direct, to a greater or lesser extent, it, it is Iran. And we're going to be talking quite a bit about Iran through this evening. But first of all, I wanted to start with Beirut. And, and, and Beirut, a few years ago, I spoke at the um, Festival of Dangerous Ideas in Brisbane, sorry, in Sydney. And um, at the festival, I was invited to speak about freedom of the press as if, as if that was a dangerous idea. Do you think journalism is a dangerous idea? Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. And I would like to say hello to everyone. Uh, Actually, journalism for me is a is something always is problematic. So my relationship with the journalism, uh, when I work, when I write, and I do journalism, or when I read others, uh, because uh, my perspective uh, or the position that I always have been is in a position of a marginalized person or a part of a minority. So that's why uh, my perspective uh, about journalism is quite critical all the time, you know? And I think we should always stay critical because uh, unfortunately these days, uh, uh, in terms of journalism, uh, the media, Many of the media are owned by uh, the people who have a political agenda, and uh, when the uh, you know our understanding of a journalism sometimes is really wrong, uh, especially when but when it comes to we have a lazy journalist. People really journalists don't go and do research to see the different layers of the issue. Uh, and uh, also the media and the papers and journalists rely on uh, official sources. And I think that is uh, a huge problem, especially when it comes to a country like Iran, who you cannot rely on the media that uh, are in Iran, inside Iran. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of Australia, I experienced that as well with uh, when I was uh, in Manus Island. You know, all the time we already were uh, behind compared to someone like Peter Dutton when he's someone killed in Manus. He just says something and the media rely on what he said. And I think that is a uh, problem, you know, this uh, language that is used by journalists, this for like an official language. And we need a kind of journalism to really uh, open a window or create a space for uh, the minorities, oppressed people to be here. And the biggest example that I experienced myself over the past year is about Iran, that we know that this movement, uh, Women Life Freedom, has started in Kurdistan. We know that Gina was Kurdish. We know that uh, Kurdistan and Baluchistan were leading this protest in Iran. But in the end, the Western media, when they wanted to give a, offer a platform to Iranian women to talk, most of the time, this, and I can say all the time, this platform goes to middle class Tehrani people. That's why I say that we courts, we are colonized two times, once by the uh, Iranian regime, and secondly, by the Western media, that they don't go and really find out that what is happening in Iran. And that's why we haven't heard from Kurdish women to talk about this slogan, to talk about this political culture existing in Kurdistan. And uh, I think, yeah, I can share many examples in the Iranian context. Beruz, but you, you, I just want to go back to something you said earlier, where you said you accuse journalists, and particularly Western journalists, of often writing with a political agenda. But is it possible, I mean, the act of 
of journalism itself is, is political. You, what you wrote from Manus Island was political. It was designed to, to, to bring about political change, wasn't it? It's not possible to create journalism that is not political, is it? No, no, I'm not uh, uh, saying that uh, journalism is not political. It's political, you know. And if we look at the history of journalism, actually, we know that uh, this, uh, the Western countries, or we can say colonizers at that time when they want to, uh, you know, other countries, I think the warning of those places in Africa, in the... Um, New Zealand, in those countries that colonized, I think uh, a big part of Western understanding of those places was come from uh, journalists. Journalists were writing, you know. So, of course, journalism is political. But uh, what I'm saying is that uh, when, uh, and when I say Western, because we have the only journalism that we have is true journalism, is we can't find it in the West. You know, uh, but in other parts of the world, really, we cannot find that. So what I am saying is uh, the problem is this media, when that come to dictatorship systems, they rely on their sources. You know, for example, I you give you an example, a very simple example, but very painful, that last year in Baluchistan, Baluchi people are ethnic minorities in Iran. In one day or in few hours, the government killed 100 people, protesters. So what's happened, one of the Iranian uh, news agency, which is owned by the government, uh, put a headline that these people were terrorists and they wanted to kill some commanders. And, that, and they killed 20 people. And they didn't mention in the news, in the report, that 100 innocent people killed. So that news was quoted by uh, Associated Press, then Guardian, Washington Post, even BBC. All of this, they used the same story. And we knew the story that was completely wrong. Why? Because the first journalists in Associated Press rely on the Iranian uh, official. So that is uh, just my point, you know? Okay. But of course, it is a very difficult, complicated context, you know? Even in Australia, we, you know, I as a refugee, detainee, I it was really hard for me to create a way for myself to publish my work. And it took a long time that this media would see me as a journalist. And I was a journalist. I want to come you to know, that. It took time, it took years that I proved that, that I'm a journalist. Why you just see me as a refugee? Beruz, I want to come, I want to talk about your, your experience on Manus Island in a minute, but I, I do want to ask Geraldine, um, you know, you spent quite a few, well, a lot of years um, as a foreign correspondent. Do you hear what Beruz says about, about, about the, the failure of a lot of Western journalism? I, I absolutely hear it, and I don't disagree with it. I would only say that it is fiendishly difficult to operate in Iran. Uh, I was lucky to get in there seven times, and just getting a visa was really difficult, and usually it was very limited time visa, so it was like, initially it was 48 hours, and so you do not sleep, you are up uh, every minute of that time, and for me, um, the main thing was getting rid of my minder from the committee to promote virtue and prevent vice and, <laughs> and, and get you know, out of Tehran if possible. And that was the, the, the greatest advantage of the chador because if you put the chador on and you hop in the back of a dissident's pickup truck with his other women relatives, nobody at a checkpoint is going to look very closely at somebody else's women. And so I was able to do some reporting that way. But 
for me, it's always been that you report from, from the ground up, not the top down. I was not interested in what the official story was ever. Um, but you just have to accept that it, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. It's hard to get people to trust you. You get there and they don't know who you are. You could be, you know, and then after I read Kylie's book, I thought, I was so lucky to get in and out of there so many times doing those things because any one of those times I could have been joining you in Evan. And they actually took us once to Evan to show us what a humane prison <laughs> system they had. But I think Iran is really poorly understood. I think there's a tremendous drumbeat of um, warmongering going on against Iran, I think largely stirred up by Saudi interests. And I think that the, the greatest misunderstanding is, you know, the, the authoritarian regime there is so hated by the people. This is a, a thin crust of oppression on top of an incredibly vibrant um, population who are much more natural allies to the West than any of the Gulf states with which the West is currently aligned. But you started out by saying, is journalism dangerous? Yes. Murdoch. <laughs> <laughs> I think he, he has done more, more damage to the environment uh, and to the wretched of the earth than any other human being on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> and yet uh, he owns the Wall Street Journal, which well, is your... Well, I wasn't working there then, but you know, <laughs> I, I had left before that, but you know, all of us in journalism, that was our, our nightmare is one day we're gonna wake up working for Murdoch. <laughs> because he was, you know, the great yeah. vacuum cleaner sucking up mastheads all over the world. Yes. Kylie, we can spend a lot of time talking about journalism. We've got three journalists on stage here, but we generally also don't think of academic work as, as dangerous. Now, I know that the reasons that you're arrested and charged with espionage are very complicated, but did you ever anticipate that your work in Tehran, your academic work, would, would, be, would turn out to be dangerous? Absolutely not. Um, I, you know, I, I yes, I'm very aware that I'm on the panel right here with, with three journalists and I'm the odd one out in a way. Um, but I, but, but I, don't I think, think there's a great deal that's, as much that separates academic writing from journalism as, 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 no, as I suggest. No, I mean, certainly it's still not the same. field work academic research. Yeah. You know, there, there are academics that... that's what you were doing. That was what I was doing, yes. And, you know, there's a big difference, I guess, between sitting behind a desk and doing a data analysis or whatever in the university or going out into the field and collecting data, doing interviews as a journalist would on the ground. Um, and really that wasn't what I was doing in Iran when I was arrested. And I'm not a scholar of Iran. I'd never published anything about Iran. Um, I was actually invited there to attend an academic conference, which, you know, is a very standard practice that many academics undertake. Um, and because my area of expertise was the Middle East, um, you know, I'd, I'd long had a fascination for Iran, like what Geraldine was saying. It's an incredible ancient country with a, um, a vibrant population and it's, it's a really interesting place. So in that respect, you know, it, it, it was a fascinating place to be able to visit. But um, yes, I think it's very interesting looking at the differing approaches of the academic community and of university scholars um, when one of their own is, is, is taken or is kidnapped or is taken hostage, as opposed to journalists. Um, I often remark about that because I really admire the way in which journalists really band together and get behind one another when one of them is, is taken, like um, unfortunately what happened to Peter. Um, we have other journalists right now in prison around the world and, you know, Wall Street Journal, Evan, Evan Gershkovitz. Evan Gershkovitz yeah. and, and look at the campaign for him. And I always think, gosh, wouldn't it be amazing if academics did the same for it's, our own? It's actually, it's true. It's one of the things that really frustrated me because I now straddle both. I'm, I'm now an academic with uh, Macquarie University. I was, when Kylie was in prison, I was with um, the University of Queensland and it drove me mad to try and rally the kind of support for you that I felt we were able to do for journalists. And I never really understood why academics were so reluctant to engage with it. Do, do you have a sense of why? 
A cynic would say, and I'm very aware I'm speaking on a university campus right now. Well, <laughs> um, let's be dangerous, but, shall we? <laughs> um, other than this university, of course, um, a cynic would say it's it's the corporate university structure. It's you know everybody's in a precarious position. Nobody has tenure. Nobody has sort of long long term career prospects that are that are secure. So there is this sort of fear of stepping out of bounds and annoying the the big wigs at the top and the powers that be and and putting a target on your back potentially i think that does come into it but universities are supposed to be places to discuss dangerous ideas maybe 30 40 years ago they were but <laughs> i think anybody unfortunately i mean i i'm being very negative here um, universities are still wonderful thriving places of debate and conversation but i think we can all recognize that unfortunately in some on some issues um that has become curtailed in, in recent times, I, I believe. We'll come back to your experience in prison shortly, but I, I, I want to go to Beirut because Beirut, even before you left Iran, you were working as a journalist. You set up um, a magazine celebrating Kurdish culture. Did you think that that was going to be such a dangerous thing at the time? Yeah, actually, my main... Uh, uh, activity in that part of Kurdistan. I come from the most, probably one of the most assimilated part of Kurdistan. Uh, so on um, that time, uh, kind of uh, meetings just to, uh, you know, as you mentioned, celebrate the culture. Because in that part of Kurdistan, unfortunately, over the past 20 years, uh, I don't know how, but suddenly people started to forget about their own like mother language. And that was uh, really painful. I, as a court, I couldn't accept that to see that people in my city are losing their language. They feel humiliated when they speak in Kurdish. So I was a uh, I'm doing some activities, uh, but in the same time, I was working with some Kurdish media out of uh, Iran. But uh, generally, the reason that I left Iran was for a magazine that I didn't found it. I was just a part of it. Some other did it. But uh, the magazine, we just published it two times. And we were aware that it is a risk. We were aware that that is not going to work, but we thought that we should do it. Even if they asked us, still, we already, already did something, you know? So that's why uh, I left Iran, because they just put pressure on us. They raided the and, officers, uh, so, didn't they? Raid, they raided yeah, the officers the and arrested your colleagues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they read it. They read it. But actually, the magazine is very small, so we didn't have really readers, you know? We didn't have. It just started. So, so, why was, you know? so why was writing about Kurdish culture so threatening to the authorities that it would justify raiding and arresting the people behind it? Yeah, Iran is the country with a, a long history of colonization. You know, as you mentioned, uh, that, you know, in Iran, when foreigners visit the country, so it doesn't matter they're journalists or academic, most of the time, they don't let them to go and see uh, Kurdistan, Baluchistan, those places. Because already we have a colonial knowledge about Iran in academia in the West that Iran is just Persian. Iran is a, uh, you know, doesn't have other languages, but actually Iran at least has seven, eight languages and Kurdish languages, language like 10 million or 8 million people to speak in that language. But the problem is that the only formal language is Farsi. So that's why uh, anything that you do to protect your language, to develop it. They look at it as a threat 
against the national security. They look at it in that way. That is their perspective, you know? So, uh, of course, it's very difficult, different between a Kurdish activist and others in Iran, because anything that you do, I know that Iran is a dictatorship system. Um, it's for everyone. Everyone are suffering. Everyone are fighting against this system. But we should see these layers of uh, oppression. You know, we can, even now, now that I'm talking with you, I am one of the most unpopular people in um, media or in uh, social media in Iran. Why? Because I talk about my rights. Because I tell them that Iran is a colonial country, that we should, uh, if we want to be a part of Iran, if we want to keep Iran, we should establish a new system that I as a court and other ethnic minorities feel that they are a part of this country, you know? So that's why and anything that you do is a political, as a court. Even if you, if you write a poem, can it I, can be a very political. Kylie, were you aware of the kind of um, the pressure on Kurdish culture when you were in prison? Was that something that filtered through into the, in, behind the bars and, in Evan? Oh, absolutely. Um, not just Kurdish culture, but as Behrouz is saying, most of the minority groups in Iran um, are culturally repressed. Um, and there's a huge number of them in prison. So many Kurds, especially in um, Qachak prison where I spent three months, um, huge Kurdish population. The number of Azeris and Kurds together would have uh, surpassed the number of ethnic Persians, actually, despite it being in the center of, of the country um, near Tehran. So some of my good friends in prison were Kurdish. They weren't all there because of Kurdish-related um, you know, political activity. Some of them were. Um, many of them you know, were, had committed a crime or had been accused of committing a crime and were innocent. Um, but you know, you, you're very aware of those ethnic divisions in prison because People will speak their language there. They will have different cultural traditions, sometimes different religious traditions. I mean, a lot of the Kurds in Iran are Sunni Muslim and not Shia Muslim, like the majority um, of the country. So there is this sort of religious distinction too, and you're very much aware of those cultural um, and religious uh, differences in prison. It's very interesting. One of the things I'd like to segue a little bit away from um, the sort of dynamics of, of Persian and Iranian culture, Iranian politics, to talk a little bit about writing it itself in prison. Um, and I think one of the things that I became very aware of, and one of um, my cellmates, um, a guy called Allah Abdul Fattah, spoke to me of, of the power of words from behind bars. Now, again, we'll come to Beirut on this in a moment, but I really am interested. You we found it very, very difficult to write from prison, but you did smuggle some letters out. Can you tell us about the experience of writing from prison? What were you trying to do? What, was, what, were, you, what were you doing? What were you aiming to achieve with it? And was it, how dangerous was it? I wrote a lot of things in prison. Most of them did not come out and either on my person when I was released or smuggled. They just disappeared. Somebody took them. They were thrown in the bin, um, some of them flushed down the toilet by myself, but um, a diverse array of subject matter. I mean, most of the fiction writing or the academic writing that I did in prison, I knew would never see the light of day. And it was just for my own entertainment or for using my brain in some constructive way. Uh, the letters that I, I, well, there was a huge number of things that I tried to smuggle out of prison. The letters that were published were very random, in, in my opinion, as to which ones actually made it out and which didn't. Did you, did you have, you'd had no control over that? No, at not at all, no. It, there was a sort of a chain of possession that it passed through um, before the, the ones that eventually were published made it to the Western media. And largely they were pretty sort of innocuous dry, boring letters written to judicial officials, revolutionary guards, uh, people. But they carried weight. They carried real power. I, I think mean. they did because of 
a certain number of offhand remarks in the letters about, you know, being psychologically tortured, for instance, or being on hunger strike. But it was never my intention to sort of write a letter and say, hey, everyone, I'm on hunger strike, pay attention. It was myself writing to the head of the Iranian judiciary saying, dear sir, um, all of these things have been done to me. It's in contravention of your own laws as well as international law. Um, you know, by the way, when I was on hunger strike, X happened, Y happened. I think rather than being so overt and obvious in that sense. But um, the random ones that did make their way out, I'm so grateful that they did because they did play an important role in, in drawing attention to my plight. And I, I still to this day believe that without the public campaign and the public support for me, I might still be there. And the letters played a role in that? The letters did? Yeah. I, I believe so, yes. I believe they helped galvanise it. You know, it was the first time anyone had heard me, in my own words, in my own voice, speak for myself from behind bars there. So I think it did play an important role. Beruz, you, you mentioned that it took a long time for, for uh, journalists, Western journalists, to see you as a journalist. What were you trying to achieve with your writing? Initially, I think you were treated more as a source than as, as, a, as a writer in your, own, in your own right. Yeah, actually, uh, it's quite complicated because, you know, the first journalist that I met um, through my phone was Ben Doherty. From The Guardian. From Guardian. And, yeah, yeah, and I Ben did some very stories about uh, Carly as well. Yeah, so it's really... It's great. Uh, interesting that he was quite different with others compared to others when he uh, we just met each other uh, he when I say I'm journalist he just accept, accepted me and we started to work together but on that time for two years I was um, uh, afraid or I was quite uh, I didn't want that the authorities know that who is this source, who is working there, because, uh, you know, I didn't feel safe in front of the system. I could die easily by an infection, you know. Who knows that who I was, you know. So that's why it took like two years that I created a, a network of uh, the human rights defenders, journalists, and people and then I became sure that I'm able to publish my work. You know, so I mean, then later I met with uh, Michael Gordon from The Age. And Michael was really a great man, you know, with a big heart. And uh, I remember that Michael asked me and said, Berus, I am going to talk with my editors, that they let you to become a columnist. Uh, you write for them per week. And he went, and then he came back to me and said, I'm really sorry. They don't understand you, you know? So I mean, with other journalists, so I had a good experience with journalists, and also I had bad experience. And with some other journalists, they just, uh, you know, I used to do almost everything about that story, the subject, the, like evidence. Even I did interview for them on my phone with the refugees and sent it to them. And when they published the story, they just mentioned me as a source. And when I asked them, why you do that? And they said, because our editors. And I think the reason that was like that, because uh, I think they look at me as a, some, just being a journalist in Manus was against the image that they had about refugees. Yeah. Or it was against uh, imagine it like that, you know? So it was like, a, they didn't like, you know, but it took time, it took time. And we, then I started to publish my work in Guardian and that became, uh, you know, that was really great. I mean, the role of Guardian in this context, not only because of my stories, my writing, 
just generally is really incredible. And also the Saturday paper was really good. So generally it was difficult to, you know, create a space. But recently, after some years, we, know, we see that it's much easier for people with refugee background to publish their work, you know, because I don't know, might they think that, oh, probably potentially is like virus. You know, yeah, when they want say, to reject it, they just say, oh, no, we should, yeah. You're, you're... But it's very paradoxical, you know, my feeling, because, you know, many media in Australia really have been supporting me, journalists, uh, and also like MEAA did a, a great job. But generally, uh, it was uh, a, a challenging uh, relationship with journalists. Beruz, did you find it dangerous in Manus? Did you did the authorities were they aware, did they did you feel any consequences from your from your writing? Uh, yes and no. You know, yes because uh, I come from Iran, and of course we are carrying a kind of. Trauma, coma. So we know that how is rioting or in Iran it can be dangerous. So when I ended up in that prison, of course I uh, had that image with myself, that feeling. But in the, no, because I could see uh, that many people in Australia really are standing up uh, against that system. And also, uh, Pan International started to, you know, recognize my work. They support me, and so that's why I became, I felt safe. So not all the time, but sometimes, and sometimes not. So, but uh, you know, the problem with Manus was not that they target me or not. It's circumstances a situation, lack of medical treatment. Mm. This, uh, you know, a very, the prison itself was the, for me, I mean, because many people killed and they were not journalists, mm. you know, they were not writers. 14 people, 14 people killed under that system in Manson and Naru. So, and I think over the past two decades, more than 50 people killed in Australia detention system. So that's why it's not necessarily they target me. It, the prison was a danger itself. And I think, I mean, I think it's hard to draw a direct line between your writing, but I think it's indisputable that your writing had a, had a very powerful influence on the decision to close the, the detention centres, and I think that's something that really is, is laudable. Um, <laughs> Kylie, just very quickly, I, I, I want to ask you about writing one more thing from, from prison. You tried to keep some notes. Did you try and keep a diary? Keeping any sort of personal reflection was very dangerous because everything would be read, probably photocopies would be made, and, you know, it could be used against me either in court or after the court. You know, I was pulled into interrogations even six weeks before my release. So um, you're very, very cognizant of the fact um, in prison that you're constantly being watched and everything you do, somebody's recording somewhere in a book. Um, so... I would regularly destroy my own writings, and when I wrote, I would write in code stuff that I myself would understand, but um, a semi-literate Revolutionary Guards person who did not speak good English would not be able to comprehend at all. Um, and then I would periodically destroy that material, essentially. I'd memorized vast swathes of information, though. My book, actually, people will ask me, why does it have so much detail in it? And it's because I would play memory games with myself and would regularly, um, each day toward the end, spend hours going over all of my mem memory cues that I'd put in my head, um, memorizing more than a year's worth of meetings, conversations, documents, um, my own poetry, 
um, rap music that I used to write, all sorts of random things. And it, it would be written in my head. I'd never have it down on paper for very long because of the danger of it being um, taken and photocopied and used against me. Do you think being in prison helped that process of memory? Absolutely, and I wouldn't be able to do it again now. Um, not at all. Like, uh, I don't know if you've ever met someone who's memorized the Quran from front to back and can sort of pick out, you know, Surah number 12 and, and recite it to you. That's amazing. And I've never understood how anyone can do that. And only being put in that situation in prison where I had no choice but to write and imprint in my brain certain bits of information, did I realize we have this amazing skill as humans that's so underutilized today with technology. Do you think, the, do you think being in prison changed the way that you wrote, the experience of prison itself? Did it change your prose? After prison or yeah. during prison? Well, during prison, I guess both the question. Let's start oh. with during. I mean, during prison, absolutely, everything, every scrap of paper was precious. You know, you didn't, I certainly didn't have reams and reams of paper. There was no access to notebooks or something like that. Um, at the beginning, you know, even a pen was banned. So I had a secret pen that I would hide in the drain pipe of my toilet and um, in various other locations too. They were constantly getting discovered and I'd have to steal another one and then that would get discovered. And it was my most precious possession was my pen. Um, and I lived in constant fear of the ink running out. So I had to write very, very small, use minimal ink and was- and what did you write on? Scraps of packaging, toilet right. paper. I used toilet paper cardboard. as well. Right? Yeah, anything okay. you can get your hands it's, on. <laughs> it was useful. I found rolling up toilet paper. Um, I yes. used to have long scrolls of it and I'd roll it up and smuggle it out. Because yep. toilet paper doesn't feel like paper. It actually sort of slipped inside your trousers, inside your underwear. It actually doesn't feel like, well, it doesn't feel like anything you're trying to smuggle. <laughs> Um, they weren't checking your underwear very carefully, no, they I wouldn't, don't they, think. They were a bit Mine squeamish. was maybe different to, to yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but Geraldine, you were also in prison. I, I, you very, know, very briefly, well, luckily. Yeah. Briefly in, in Nigeria, but I don't think we should minimise it. I mean, I don't think there is a kind of relative. I, mean, I made a joke about it earlier, but these things, um, there is no sort of relative um, horror here that you experience. When you're incarcerated, you're incarcerated, and that, that's always a big deal. It was for about three days, I think, in Nigeria when you were covering, uh, following Ken Sarawiwa. Uh, yes, so Ken Sarawiwa was a wonderful uh, Nigerian writer from the Ogoni tribe uh, down in the Niger Delta, and he was very beloved in Nigeria. He'd written a, a Nigerian sitcom that was a big hit. And then he became the leader of a resistance movement among the Agoni people whose lands had been absolutely trashed by Royal Dutch Shell. They'd been operating there for over 35 years and they had oil spills that were 30 years old that had never been cleaned up. They had, um, uh, and this was in an area of absolutely desperately poor subsistence farmers, even on the harsh, scale of the poor world. This was one of the poorest places I'd ever seen. And after 35 years of Shell extracting billions in oil wealth, there was not one clinic, there was not one school, there were barely any roads. They had put nothing back into the community, just poisoned the wells and the fields. And Ken we were led a, a nonviolent protest, and it was just a sit-in, just farmers sit-in. And Shell called on the brutal dictatorship of Sunni Abacha to come and put that protest down. And they massacred those people. They shot them, they macheted them. And he came to New York um, and talked to the foreign editor of the Wall Street Journal about this. And honestly, I didn't believe it because I didn't think a major oil company would be stupid enough to act like that. And, but luckily in those days, you know, the journal just said, go and check it out. And so I managed to sneak my way into the region uh, without permission and, <laughs> and went around and collected evidence. And it was worse than Ken had actually described once I'd talked to the survivors and seen their injuries and seen the devastation of their villages. And then, as you do as a reporter, I went to the military to get their side of the story. <laughs> <laughs> and they handed me over to the secret police. And um, 
I, I was lucky in that I didn't really grok what I was dealing with because it wasn't a country I worked in a lot. And I was just, I was misled by the bravery of Nigeria's own journalists because they had been writing so critically in their lively press. And I thought, well, you know, uh, then I learned that half of them were in jail also. Um, but they hadn't got to the point of killing people, which came later. Um, but so, uh, yeah, so I was in this, um, in this cell and uh, I didn't know how long they were going to keep me. I didn't have a clue. Did you, did, did they know much about the reporting that you had done? Had you no, luckily, it? luckily I was able to, when I realized what was going on, I just took all my notebooks and I slid them under the mats in the car. And luckily the driver was a very good guy and he just took them away and destroyed them. He destroyed so, them, he didn't? Well, I don't know what happened to okay, them. I never, never saw them, them again, but he turned out to be an excellent guy because when um, some nuns that worked in the region that I'd been scheduled to go and see when I didn't turn up, they went and found him and he told them what had happened and that's how the word got back to the Wall Street Journal. So I, I take it you weren't able to take, you didn't take notes from, from inside the cell? The, the, I didn't have anything. Uh, I didn't have a thing. They took everything and uh, all I could, I didn't, you know, all I could do was luckily my grandmother was a great advocate of memorizing poetry. So I just <laughs> worked my way through every poem that I had memorized. And when I got to the end of my poems and Shakespeare's soliloquies, I did recipes. <laughs> <laughs> Did the experience of, of prison in, influence your own writing? I mean, obviously, it, it, it would have made a part of that story. Um, well, you know, but so I did write a little bit about it. You know, in, in the Wall Street Journal, they weren't into you writing about yourself very much, so I, I minimized it. But, but luckily, you know, I, I was able to remember um, much of it was so vivid. I had, I had plenty to write about what Shell had done and, and, uh, and I was able to confirm it. And it did lead to an internal movement within Shell to seek change. Um, but it didn't help the Nigerian situation. And Ken Sarawiwa was executed. went back there. He, he had a home in London and he could have led the movement from, as an expatriate, but he went back and he was stitched up on false charges and, and hanged. And, and, it was, and Shell didn't lift a finger to prevent that happening. It must have been very painful for you to see that and also to see the way the, the, the crackdown on, on the Agoni people were... Well, it, did, it, it didn't stop and the Agoni got more and more militant. So they brought everything that happened subsequently on themselves, yeah. But I had, I had been deported and, and it said never to re-enter. So I couldn't go back and follow that story. Did the experience influence your non-fiction? Oh, sorry, influence your fiction? Oh, I, I think everything influences, influences my fiction. And I would never be able to write the books if I hadn't had hmm. uh, that 15 years of reporting and barging into people's lives. We're, going to, we're jumping a bit ahead here, in fact, because I, I do want to backtrack a little bit. There was one other thing that we discussed when, when we talked earlier, and that is that you mentioned that you, you actually have also quite a bit of experience from the outside trying to communicate with other people who are imprisoned. Yes, yeah, well, um, you know, doing, that, doing the kind of work that you and I did for such a long time, uh, your sources are regularly wind up in the slammer. And I always felt... And sometimes because of the reporting that we do. Luckily, in my case, no. They, I was interviewing... Well, I'll, I'll be specific. So there was a young Palestinian boy uh, who was um, militant in the first intifada. And um, I, was, I was pretty new to uh, the region. And my foreign editor had said, you need to interview one of these Palestinian stone throwers. And I had no idea how I was going to go about that, but I thought I'll go to Hebron because there's always, there's always something in Hebron. And uh, on the road there, a boy stoned my car. 
<laughs> and so I thought, great. That's <laughs> so I jumped out and I spent the day with him. And it was, his story was so moving. And so, you know, I wrote it and, um, and I really wanted to know what happened with him. And I went back and he was, of course, he'd been arrested because he'd, gone, he'd graduated from Stones to Molotov cocktails. I was able to see him when he had court dates and I could grab a few words with him. And I knew that he loved the study of English. So I tried to get him some English books. And this is something that, um, enrages me, but it also gets me up in the morning that jailers are so afraid of books. And I tried to take him The Old Man and the Sea because the simple language I thought would be accessible to him, and I forget what else, but the Israeli um, military wouldn't allow him to have any of those books. And, you know, that's been true um, in a lot of cases. I know with um, talking to um, Michael Murray, who was the military um, lawyer for David Hicks, he tried to give Hicks, uh, I think it was To Kill a Mockingbird. No. It's, it's just extraordinary how, how difficult it is to, to get novels and relatively benign novels through. Well, that's it, but it's, they're not benign. <laughs> um, um, Anything that, this that is, does the business of fiction, which is to tell us what it is like to be a human being, is yeah. essentially dangerous. Because in prison, you're supposed to be, be, have your humanity stripped away from you. Kylie, you found books in prison. Um, you mentioned a couple of books, a couple of, one surprising book too, I think, George Orwell. Oh, yes. Um, well, my Speaking experience... Speaking of powerful literature. <laughs> my experience sort of aligns with what Geraldine was saying largely. It was only um, in the last few months where I was moved to a public prison, um, living amongst regular criminals and not in a high max security facility that I was allowed sort of unfettered mm -hmm. access to books, um, most of which were not in English. Um, and there was even a book fair inside the prison once a year, and it happened to fall in, in the three months I was there. And I bought 1984 by George Orwell in an Iranian prison, and that was <laughs> completely... I mean, I, I imagine, actually, it could have been censored in some parts. Um, obviously, if it's in Farsi translation and somebody's approved it for sale, you don't know what kind of translation it would have been. Um, I also bought Kafka. I was... Um, I think, no, I didn't buy it. I got it from the library in Farsi, the prison library, and was attempting to sort of translate it one page a day into English. Um, but I, it just sort of, I don't know, I think it was the rebel in me that just liked the idea of Orwell and Kafka in an authoritarian <laughs> prison. And, and, but, you know, I think if you're very sophisticated, what Geraldine was saying is correct in that um, the content of the book matters and your jailers don't want you to have access to, mm. you know, human stories of, of hope or, or anything uplifting or exploratory of the human condition. But in my case, most of the books that I wanted to have, I wasn't allowed to have, and books were routinely instrumentalized and used against me um, as sticks in a kind of a carrot and stick game by my captors. They didn't care about the content of the books at all. It was just a book is a privilege. A book is something that humanizes you, it's, that that allows you to, to use your mind and to, to escape from this horrific hellscape you're living in and go into another world for a few hours. And that is not allowed because we want you to suffer. You um, know, I think um, initially Azar Nafisi was going to join us on this panel. And I had a wonderful experience uh, with her many years ago when she was still in Iran. And she let me come and observe her teaching a class to Iranian university students. And it was a very sophisticated um, class. I, that, that day she was teaching Nabokov's um, the, the, the Real, no. It's the the, life, it was the Life and Times of David Kay. No, it's... Um, was it? Sebastian Knight, The Real Life of Sebastian Knight. Ah, uh, okay. And um, <laughs> she, uh, she started the class by reading a Soviet um, propaganda novel. And the more sophisticated kids in the class laughed at it, laughed at the language. Um, and she said, yeah, you're laughing now, but that kind of writing is what the regime wants you to have. They don't want you to have 
this playful, tricky language that Nabokov is working with. But in her class, she also had to have some Basij, who were the young, um, impoverished Iranians who had been used as cannon fodder in the war with Iraq. And they were allowed into university, even though they didn't have the academic qualifications. And they were often absolutely tormented and outraged by the teaching of literature. Um, they, they couldn't stand even um, pride and prejudice because it made fun of a clergyman. Huh. They didn't like Wuthering Heights because there was an illicit love affair. Hmm. And she said when she tried to show them the film of um, Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> they cut Which the is, balcony scene because, uh, as the uh, as the woman revolutionary guard said, it's indecent. She's wearing her nightgown, <laughs> and then they they cut the ballroom scene because it was men and women dancing. She said all that was left was the dueling scene and the death. <laughs> <laughs> I I was I was a little bit lucky in the. In, in the early stages, um, I had access to some books as well. And I, I had Fernando Pessoa's Book of Disquiet, which is an extraordinary, beautiful book. And I think it is that connection with literature that actually does help restore your, 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 your sense of humanity, your sense of connection. And that was immensely powerful and important for me. But after that, um, they denied, for me, they took everything away, all writing material, all reading material. And we went through an incredibly difficult period which I found um, was almost as hard as uh, going without food. Mm. Um, it, was, it was a sort of real nourishment that was that, was that kind of sensory deprivation, but also the, the emotional deprivation, the connection that the books bring. And I, you don't think of that as, as reading dangerously, mm. but in prison it, it, it really mattered. You know, even in, uh, even in Australia, mm. when Bob Brown was in prison in uh, Risdon, they wouldn't let him have books by Henry David Thoreau. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Kylie, your book, um, we talked about this earlier, you're, you're having it translated into Farsi, talking of reading dangerously. Now, it won't be sold in the bookshops, will it? Well, it, it might be. Um, <laughs> you probably know more about this than I do, yeah. about the sort there of is. underground... Um, Trade in, in books in Iran. So your book already translated to Farsi, is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. But they're telling. I mean, yeah, yeah. from what I understand, it will be so, sold in Iran, just you know, without the yeah, yeah. approval of definitely, the authorities. Yeah, yeah. So what they do actually, they definitely don't let your book published in Iran. But uh, in the there is a street in Tehran, which is the main street for literature or bookshops or like and club. So. In Ankara, they go, some people, because Iranians are very good at uh, just, they don't care about copyrights. They get your book, they print it, and they make a book, and they sell it on the street. So I'm quite sure that your book is selling on the street now. So it's <laughs> I like believe so. <laughs> so yeah, 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 that will happen for your book. Oh, it is happening now. There is, is no friend but the mountains in, available? Your book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No friend but the mountains had a different story because uh, suddenly that book became, uh, you know, known in Iran. And uh, there was like a public pressure on me to publish the book in Iran. And on that time, finally say yes. So the book published in Iran, but after like 30 days, 35 days, they stopped uh, just printing the book. So they didn't print the book again. Just it was on the market just for 35 days or 30 days. But uh, yeah, I think still on the street, they are selling that book. In a way, they are selling uh, highly books. So, yeah, it's, it's quite, uh, the problem with Iranian system now is, is censorship rather than, you know, because the book is, it can be available. You can just share it on Telegram on I don't know, on other platforms in Iran, in like literature groups. So, but uh, now I think it's much easier for people to have access to books compared to before. Do you, do you think that your book is, is 
is risky to, to buy and to read for, for Iranians? Uh, my book? Yes. No, I don't think it's not like that. You know, uh, uh, now in the age of social media, they cannot target everyone. You know, they cannot target everyone. So it's quite different compared to like 20 years ago. But they oppress people, the society, in a different way. You know, they are violent on the street. They kill people easily. They beat people easily. But in terms of books, uh, it's not uh, really like before. They just don't let that your book get published. But if people buy it, yeah, there are many books in Iran that they are not happy with, but people are able to read them on their phone, on their computer. So, but yeah, no, I don't think that it is a risk. One of, one of the things, one of the features of your book was that you wrote it in a very literary style. It's, it's the story of your, of your journey, but it is in a, I think, a profoundly literary style. And it also seemed to have a huge influence also in this country on a lot of people. Do you think that that kind of literary culture, the literary approach that you took to writing it was a part of the, the power of the book? Yeah, definitely. And I think that written to my work in journalism, in Manus Island, because I was working for at least four years. And in the end, uh, I think I published more than, or yeah, around 100 opinion pieces that recently this year we published it as a book, not all of them, some of those articles. So I was writing for years and I thought, I was quite naive, I thought that if I write in journalism and people of Australia become aware of this situation, they cannot continue. So, and I was wrong because when I was in Manus Island, I witnessed four federal elections, but still we were there, you know? Uh, so that's why uh, within my journalism, I try hard that people of Australia really understand how the situation is. To imagine our life in Manus Island. And in the end, I thought that no, journalism uh, is not going to work, you know? So then I work on the book uh, and I try to uh, create a book with literary text, you know? So that's why I think that people understand it. People understand or imagine our pain. And in the same time, I was trying to uh, create a, like an alternative knowledge in this context, you know, to challenge that image about refugees because they dehumanized us. And it's really interesting. It's still I'm suffering from that dehumanization process mm. because many people, they look at me through an image that they have about refugees. And still I should fight against that, you know? Uh, and of course, that dehumanization process in Manus Island is, it's very possible that you, as a refugee, you internalize that humiliation. You internalize that image that they create about you, you know? So, I mean, <clears throat> but writing, it was important for me because I didn't escape to writing. <clears throat> writing was not a place for me that I escaped. Writing was a weapon that I use it to expose that system, <clears throat> to challenge that system. So that was my perspective towards uh, writing. <clears throat> and it's quite interesting that still, I believe that uh, <clears throat> the journalism work that published in the second book, I like this book quite, I don't know why, I like it more because probably written bit by bit and the slowly. Geraldine, you've, you've straddled both forms of writing, journalism and fiction, as we've discussed. Do you use your fiction to convey 
ideas in ways that you couldn't as a journalist? I mean, what's the difference for you? Not intentionally. Uh, I think subconsciously, probably, because I think all my books are about the same thing in the end. Uh, they're set in different times and places, but they all boil down to the same idea. But you do, you do touch on parts of, of, of history that are often have contemporary elements to them, and, and you do force us to look and think about those things. I'm reading The People of the Book at the moment, which deals with um, the, the war in Bosnia. Mm. And that's, I found that quite visceral. I, I, I worked in Bosnia as well. I covered that, and I found that a very powerful book. And I imagine that if you're approaching it as a, as a reader rather than as a, of a novel rather than a, as a piece of journalism, then you'll, you'll, you'll receive it differently. You know, I like, to, I like to follow the fact as far as I can because I believe what Mark Twain said. Uh, fiction must be plausible, truth needn't be. <laughs> uh, and things that really happen are often way more astonishing um, than inventions. But that book is a case in point. Not only is that book the same as all my other books, <laughs> essentially it is, it's also the same story told four or five different times about how this particular Hebrew manuscript was saved from destruction in different time periods when the virus that afflicts humanity, which is otherizing, happened. It happened in Convivencia, Spain, and the country tore itself apart, ejecting first Muslims and then Jews. And you could say that Spain has never returned to what it was, um, but that lesson didn't get learned. And then, you know, this book is um, about to be looted by the Nazis when, again, they are otherizing Jews. Uh, and then during the Bosnian War, when Serbian ultranationalists ultra couldn't stand the idea that Sarajevans represented, which is that people of difference can live and create harmoniously together, and this happens to us over and over again as a species. We, we succumb to this virus, but a few people are immune, and they're the ones who stay up, stand up and say, no, not, not this way. And that's why we still have the Sarajevo Haggadah, because people stood up and saved it. And you could also argue that it's the same virus that we're seeing unfolding in Israel and Gaza at the moment. And in the United States, otherizing otherizing people of color, uh, otherizing people of political difference. I want to take this opportunity because the, the title of this is not just writing dangerously, it is about reading dangerously. And I wonder whether we should, I'm just going to ask you to reflect a little bit on the importance of reading uncomfortable points of view, uh, things that are outside your, your, your comfort zone. I mean, if you're a supporter of of the Israelis, the Jews, and maybe reading something that would help you understand the position of the Palestinians and vice versa. Is that important? Do you think that is reading dangerously? It's, it's essential. It's essential. We all, we all need to get out of our silos and listen to other voices and, and have a little bit of humility that we might not always be right. And, um, I say this as a person who likes to think she's right a lot of the time, but it's not, it's not a healthy position. And I think that that's what's so terrifying with the war on books in the United States at the moment, where librarians are under attack and schools, school teachers are under attack because of this idea, this terrible, crazy idea that kids should not ever be discomforted. Hmm. And that anything that challenges them should be, should be removed. Well, no, they're just rewriting history because it's ugly. And we shouldn't, oh, bother their pretty heads with that. They, they should, you know, we should show them the upside of slavery. <laughs> I, I'm not joking. This is what Ron DeSantis has done to the Florida school system. In the, um, the teaching principles now, there's a, there's a bit about slavery that says some enslaved, well, they don't even use enslaved, some slaves learn very useful skills and occupations. Hmm. But isn't that the idea of libertarian, 
libertarianism. It's the freedom to, to read and think and, and explore. Well, they're the biggest hypocrites on earth. They're li libertarians because it's libertarian until it's the most personal decision that you make about your own woman's body. And then, oh no, you can't make that decision. Um, and you're, you can't choose what to read or, you know, um, uh, yeah, you can't choose what will be in, uh, we will choose for your children, not you. I'm going to, we're starting to run a little bit close to the end of this. I want to go through a couple of um, audience questions that were, were given to us earlier. Um, one of them is, says the act of writing shouldn't be dangerous. What makes it so is the way people respond. Why do we blame the writer? Who wants to take that question? Have a crack, Kylie. <laughs> no, I think Kylie asked if it's bad because it was in okay. the most dangerous place. <laughs> yeah, still I believe that Iran is really a dangerous place. Right. So Kylie should answer that. Yeah. Why, why, why do you, we... you're, you're on the spot because Iran is a dangerous place. So if you're writing... Why, why do we blame the writer for the consequences of a writer's words? I guess that's one of the key questions. I mean, do you have a... Why do we do that? Because it's easy. I mean, it's easy for an authoritarian ruler or a dictator or anybody, or Ron DeSantis or anybody, whoever it is, to say, oh, let's blame it all on the writer. They've brought up subjects that might make us feel uncomfortable or that might threaten our grip on power or whatever, um, rather than engaging with the fact that the writer's words might have resonance because the broader populace might see something, a spark or an idea in that writing that speaks to them and the writer didn't create that sentiment, it might have already been there. Um, it's, it's easy to, to try and target this one writer and, and blame them for that. Um, I, it, I think it's a scapegoating thing, really. Is it blame or is it credit? <laughs> well, it's, it can be a badge of honour, right? But if we it certainly of, can be a badge of honour. Writing on its own is just is merely lines on a page, that writing doesn't exist without a reader, that writing is that dialogue between author and reader. Um, and the, what emerges is, that, is, a, is the synthesis of those two, of those two people. But does it always, though? Like, it's sort of the tree falls in the forest, no one sees it fall, does it exist question. I mean, for me in prison, I was often writing knowing there'd be no readers and I'd just tear it up in the end and throw it down the toilet. But the act of writing still was important to me, irrespective of the fact that nobody was going to read sure, it. Sure, but what makes it dangerous is that, that dialogue, isn't it? I don't know. I mean, to me, it, uh, not everything I was writing in my view was dangerous, but I think there's just something human about the act of writing, even if we're just recording what we had for breakfast. You know, it, no matter what it is, certainly as a prisoner, it, it was almost my personhood was down there on the page. I existed if I was writing this thing. You know, for me, it was this sort of assertion of my personhood, like what Behrouz was saying, this dehumanization process you go through um, when you're in prison, when you've got jailers, when you've got people determining all the minute aspects of your day-to-day -day routine. Sometimes the act of writing, no matter how mundane it might be, you know, it has that important meaning and resonance with you because it rehumanizes you, I guess, amidst all the, the dehumanization of your condition. Did how, to what extent did prison change the way that you wrote? I don't know if it did. I, you know, as I was saying earlier, obviously when I was in prison, I was, you know, writing in code sometimes and, and that sort of thing. But since coming out, I feel that obviously I've written about prison, but my writing style or my interest in the way that I, you know, tell whatever story I'm trying to tell. I don't know if it's if it's changed. I'd be interested to hear your response to that, Peter. Sorry, I got back at no, you. No, no. Being I, someone who's also I, written after prison, has it changed you? I think it has. I think it has profoundly. Um, I think it's it's. I mean, you, one of the things you, you mentioned earlier, as, as a journalist, you you tend to write very sparsely anyway. But but in prison, every every word, every every millimeter of a page counts and you tend to be incredibly succinct and direct in your writing. Um, I became much more aware of the power of words. Um, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, 
um, I, there was one of my cellmates who really convinced me in, and told, explained to me in ways that I couldn't have understood before of just how powerful the words from behind bars would, would be and how it would influence the readers. Um, but I also think that it, I mean, I, I guess the experience, if you, 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 you put the experience, your own physical experience into your writing, and I think it shows. Um, and I think even though I've, since being out of prison, I've written some fairly glib stuff, I, th I still think fundamentally when I put myself into that mindset, um, I, I, I think it helps me, it certainly helps me write in ways that I couldn't have done before. Um, Geraldine, you're nodding. Yeah, well, I, I think also when you suffer, hmm. it, it expands your capacity for empathy. Yeah, and expression. Mm. Yeah. Beruz, do you identify with that? The suffering that you went through? Yeah, I that? think, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, as Kyle mentioned, I think that is a very important point. The act of writing is important because it's quite interesting. You know, when I was in Manus Island, I was writing a lot, and still I have many writing that I didn't publish them. I'm tired of them, so I might on the future. Uh, it's very important, you know, the act of writing itself, because uh, being a writer and be aware that you are a writer, and then you write, that is really important, that empower you. That means that you keep your dignity in that system. You know, I think that was very important for me, that when I was, they banished me to Manus Island. I was on the plane. When we arrived there, they put me in that prison. And on, throughout six years, and I did many things, but in the end, I was aware that I am a writer. That was important because I could keep my dignity as a human being and uh, just uh, push that system back, you know? And uh, uh, also when you write in a circumstance like that, uh, actually your writing is against uh, a propaganda that they create around refugees. That's why I say always, even writing a love poem is a political act. Because by writing a love poem in a place like Manus Island, mm. actually you send this message uh, that we are human beings because we can love someone. We can express ourselves in a poetic way. And that is important. So that's happening in the, term, in the context of Manus and Nord. Oh, that they, especially at the beginning, they created a huge propaganda against us, that they are drug dealers, they are you know, potential terrorists, they are drug dealers. You know, many, many things they said about us. So already the process of dehumanization happened in the media by the politicians and also later in the system itself, in Manu's prison as a, like a creature. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, that writing itself, it, because in the end, you realize that actually your writing first help you to survive. Then you look at the consequences oh, through my writing, I empower people, I empower minorities, I empower refugees, I challenge that system, I expose it. But actually the first thing that happened is the writers that you survive. I can't say that, I survive through my life. I think, I, I, I just, Geraldine, very quickly. I, what <clears throat> Beirut said just reminded me of one of the most touching poems I ever read. It was scrawled on the wall of a cell yeah. in, um, in Saddam's Kurdish detention 
prison. And it was during the Kurdish uprising after the first Gulf War when the Kurds had liberated that prison. And we went down there and it was a disgusting place. There were bits of human tissue nailed to the wall, but on the wall was scrawled this poem and it started, my darling, so many poems I have written for the beauty of your face and the perfume of your skin. And because of you, I can stand and I keep standing and keep standing. I think this is actually quite a profound moment to end this on. I can't think of words that I think more accurately reflect the theme of this evening, reading and writing dangerously. Please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking Beres Luciani, <laughs> Harry Moore Gilbert, and Gerald Inglis. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Anne Pender, and I direct the J.M. Kurtzi Centre for Creative Practice. Firstly, I want to thank all of the speakers tonight for their generosity in participating in this conversation. Peter, Geraldine, Kylie, and Beruz. Thank you. It takes, it takes courage to write about these matters and to speak about them in public as well. It was with great excitement that I first contacted Jacinta here at the Hawke Centre to suggest that we run an event together about reading and writing dangerously. The impetus for me had been reading several books by Azar Nafisi, who was mentioned, the Iranian scholar who left her home in Tehran to live in the United States because of the difficulties of reading, writing, and teaching English literature in Iran under the regime. Nafisi has written several books, including Reading Lolita in Tehran, that document how she continued to teach the works of British and American authors during the crackdowns on university lecturers. She continued to teach works by Dickens, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Nabokov, and others in spite of extreme pressure on her and on her students to reject literature from the West. Even more poignantly, she held secret reading groups at her home on a weekly basis, just for women. And these were important meetings for the women who participated. And Nafisi presents portraits of each of the women in the group as they struggle to retain some sense of their intellectual lives under siege from the authorities. As we know, there is no shortage of writers who've suffered and been imprisoned for their writing. One of my colleagues at the University of Adelaide, Professor Julian Murphitt, has just completed a book on the subject entitled Prison Writing in the 20th Century to be published by Edinburgh University Press very soon. Thank you so much to Jacinta from the Hawke Centre and Renee as well for all of the work in putting together this program with us at the Curtsy Centre. Thank you, Peter, for chairing the session Thank you all for joining us in the discussion and thank you for coming, a terrific audience. Please join me in thanking our guests again.